The, the Kurdish nation is the largest stateless uh, nation in the world. There are about between 20 to 40 million uh, uh, Kurds who live in Turkey, Iraq, Iran and Syria mainly. And the Kurds have always been an oppressed uh, a nation by the ruling classes of these countries. In, in Turkey, the Kemalist government, which came to power in the 20s, banned the Kurdish language and even banned the use of the word Kurdish. Kurds were called mountain Turks, essentially, for the majority of the, last, of the past century. In Syria, the Kurds, the majority of the Kurds have not even been allowed to you know, be given basic um, citizenship. And in Iraq and Iran, the Kurdish areas have always been kept underdeveloped uh, and uh, starved of any kind of inve investment. And the Kurds have basically, in, in one way or another, uh, been oppressed throughout, throughout history, the history of these states. Uh, and while obviously the um, these the, the ruling classes of these nations have of these countries have try have oppressed the Kurds. They've also used them for their own benefits uh, to sabotage each other's uh, uh, political how to say political sphere. Uh, and wh when they were done doing that, they haven't ever hesitated by crushing uh, the, the, the Kurdish uh, movement. Uh, I mean, we can go back to the the twenties where in, I think it's 1928, there was a Sheikh Said uprising in Turkey, supported and organized partially by the British against the, 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 the nationalist government and in defense of, of bringing back the caliphate and, and in defense of the old regime, essentially. Um, and they promised the Kurds uh, their own nation once, you know, at the peace, after, after the, the war and so on. But once the war was finished, the Kurds were just dropped to one side and there was no uh, a country, uh, no state uh, given to them. In the 70s, the Iranians and the Americans supported and armed and financed a Kurdish rebellion against the Iraqi central government uh, for about a year from 1974 to 75. But once that was, uh, once they reached a deal with Saddam Hussein about whatever they were disagreeing about, they didn't hesitate to pull the plug, pull the funding, close the borders, and basically allow Saddam to go in and crush the, uh, the, 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 the Kurds. Um, in the 80s, again, during the uh, Iran and Iraq war, the Iranians would support uh, the Kurds in northern Iraq against the Saddam Hussein regime. They would arm them in order to weaken the, the, the regime. Um, but once, once that was finished, once they were done using them, once the war was uh, drawing to an end, Saddam brutally crushed the Kurdish movement, killing tens of thousands of people. I think it's more than 100,000 people, in fact, and even using chemical weapons, while all the while being supported by the, by the United States. Again, in 91, in the first Gulf War, the, uh, George Bush called for an uprising of the Shias and the Kurds, and they rose up, and the Kurds, in fact, uh, took power in, in the areas of northern Iraq where they, where they live for, for a brief period. But again, once the war was finished, they pulled all support and they watched while Saddam was, uh, was, was crushing the Kurds. Of course, then this, all, this created a big uh, refugee crisis in Turkey and the Americans had to backtrack and come to some kind of a solution, uh, giving some kind of self-governance self and autonomy to the northern parts of Iraq. But nevertheless, it just shows the cynical attitude that the imperialists and the ruling classes of the region have always had against um, the, the, the Kurdish people. Over the past century, hundreds of thousands of Kurds have been killed, displaced, constantly been, constantly been moved from one country to another. Uh, and kept in, in subjugation only to serve the narrow and short-sighted aims of one capitalist class or another intervening in the region. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, while the, the, the ruling classes have used the Kurds in their foreign policy, they've also used the Kurdish question internally in order to cut across the class struggle in order to, um, to basically dominate and exploit their own working classes as well use the national question to dilute class uh, differences, essentially.
Um, and Western imperialism, again, has had no small part of this. In fact, after, after World War I, the Western imperialist powers divided the Middle East up in these spheres of influence, completely arbitrarily, literally drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is British sphere of influence, this is French, and so on. And while doing this, they always made sure to keep different nations and sects in each of these territories in order to be able to, if things ran out of control, to divide and rule, basically, uh, those, those countries. Uh, so, uh, yes, the, 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 the question of reactionary nationalism and sectarian uh, uh, tension has been something which has been imposed and used by the, by the ruling classes more than, uh, more than anyone, whereas in fact the peoples of the region have never had any problem living, living uh, harmoniously and peacefully next to each other. But the general situation in the whole Middle East obviously changed after the Arab Revolution and after the world economic crisis of 2008. You saw the rise of class struggle. And this up, upended, this destabilized the whole situation. And in, in Syria, during the Syrian Revolution, which started about uh, seven years ago, uh, the Assad regime was getting uh, very pressured. It was being cornered and it was being drowned out essentially, mainly in the western parts of Syria. And therefore, the Assad regime made a deal, essentially, giving uh, Kurds certain rights and handing power to some Kurdish organizations uh, in order to be able to focus on the western part, which was, being, which was seeing the, uh, the, the most uh, violent kind of revolutionary turmoil at, at that stage. Now, this vacuum of power was filled by a, an organization called the PYD. The PYD is a branch of the, of the Turkish organization, the PKK, which is a left-wing guerrilla organization set up at the end of the 70s. At that time, it was a, 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 a Marxist, it was a Stalinist, essentially, organization, left-wing organization fighting uh, for uh, Kurdish independence, but also fighting for socialism, in, as, at least in his program. Uh, now, the, uh, the, uh, the, the taking of power of the people, and from, just to clarify, in this speech, I'm just going to call it the PKK, because all the different uh, uh, you know, names and abbreviations that we know, the YPG, the PYD, the PKK, HPG, there's many, many of them. But essentially, they're all parts of the PKK organization, which is branched out into different countries, and which, had different, which has different wings, a women wing, a military wing, and uh, political wings, and so on. But essentially, it's all part of the PKK movement. Now, that was the beginning what, of what's called the Rojava uh, Revolution. For the first time in the history, the Kurdish masses were masters. Uh, the Kurdish masses were, were masters over their own lives and destinies, and ruled their own homeland. And in doing so, they set up these councils or communes, they call them, which had mass participation of of of, of the of the masses from below, uh, which who would meet, you know, on a weekly or on a regular basis, take decisions on politics, and essentially run society. Uh, uh, by themselves. They also set up the, the YPG, the, the armed wing, which is essentially a people's army, which has drawn in hundreds of thousands of, of, of uh, Kurdish youth, women and men, which is, which is very, uh, uh, which is very uh, revolutionary in, in the Middle Eastern uh, terms. And because of this, because of this very uh, democratic uh, because of the extremely democratic basis of the movement, because they were fighting for a cause, because they were fighting for their own homeland, uh, this, uh, this army became the most, the most effective, essentially the best army uh, in, in the Middle East, in the whole region, fighting in this civil war that, that then developed within uh, Syria and, uh, and Iraq. They were fighting for democracy, against sectarianism, and this had an enormous appeal to people in the areas that, that, they, that they came to. Uh, and in spite of their you know, extreme lack of funds and support and arms, they've been proven to be extremely efficient. And at the same time, this bold fight that they started, especially against ISIS, uh, and again, the, 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 the political basis on which they were based, 
they also gained enormous authority amongst uh, on the one hand, the Kurdish masses and the Kurdish youth, but amongst the whole, uh, the masses of the whole Middle East and further uh, throughout the Western world as well. In Iraqi Kurdistan, where um, at, at a certain stage the Barzani, the Peshmerga forces, which is another Kurdish militia, were pulling out, essentially handing power to ISIS because they wanted to use that against the, the Baghdad central government. It was the PKK militias who went in and saved the Yazidis who were caught, I don't know if you remember it, on Mount Sinja and being besieged uh, by, by ISIS, which was, ISIS, which was uh, encroaching on them. And um, this sent a powerful uh, shockwave throughout all of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, especially amongst uh, lots of young people who could see that their own, the, the so-called uh, Kurdish regional government, or, uh, of the, which was governed by the um, Democratic Party of Kurdistan, um, they could see that they were essentially allying themselves with, with ISIS, playing an extremely reactionary role, and all the while the PKK and the left wing of the Kurdish movement do, you know, uh, making great sacrifices to save the Yazidis. This, this gave enormous authority to the movement in Iraq um, and, 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 and essentially led to the setting up of a Yazidi organization as well. Amongst the Yazidis, of course, the PKK is now, I think, the biggest political force uh, at all. In Turkey, all of this coincided with the rise of, class of the class struggle in Turkey. If some of you might remember in 2013, in June, there was a, a mass movement in Turkey about the Gezi, the, the Gezi Park movement, it was called, which reflected the rising dissatisfaction with the Erdogan regime uh, against the, the privatizations, the attacks, the austerity measures, but also Erdogan's Islamization of society as Erdogan's authority, authoritarianism. Um, and because the, within the Kurdish left, the Turkish left, sorry, and the Turkish working class movement, none of the parties was putting up a bold uh, a, a, a op opposition to, um, to, to Erdogan, the Kurdish movement came to play a very important role. Uh, especially through this party that they had called the HCP. The HCP stood on a radical rhetoric uh, for social justice against uh, dictatorship, against uh, Islamism, and they, they, they gained a lot of support. And in the elections in 2014, they, became, they came into parliament with 13.2% uh, of the vote, as far as I remember. Now, this was a big blow to the Erdogan government because Erdogan was counting on the Kurds not gaining, there's a 10% threshold amongst the, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Turkish parliament. And he was, he was banking on the Kurdish movement not gaining uh, those 10%, and therefore all those votes and all those seats essentially in the Kurdish areas going to him, which would mean that he'd have overall majority in government, in parliament, he could change the, uh, the constitution and implement a presidential system and consolidate power in his hands, basically. So in that sense, the Kurdish movement became an existential threat uh, to Erdogan's ambitions, not just that they could stop him from expanding his, his power, but also because they were beginning to galvanize the rising class dissatisfaction in Turkey amongst themselves. Um, now, for the, Kurdish, for the Kurdish movement, this was a great achievement. Also, well, for the Turkish working class, this was a, a, a great, great achievement. Because for the first time since the 70s, you had Turkish and Kurdish workers and youth fighting together uh, 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 against the, 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 the ruling class, basically. Uh, and this was the biggest threat to Erdogan, not only in in Turkey, but also in Iraq, the undermining of the Barzani regime and Barzani, the you know the the leader of the Kurdish uh, its self-rule area in, in Iraq, is essentially a tool, is essentially a, a a puppet of the Erdogan regime. And by with the rise of the influence of the PKK, again they also became a threat to his ambitions and to his domination uh, of, of of that area. Um, at that point, you had a situation where 
Uh, now I've, I've handed out this map, so maybe you can divide it up uh, amongst you, where the, the influence of the, of the PKK was rising to such a degree that they essentially controlled a massive strip going from the Iranian border all the way, almost all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and that's the part I've kind of tried to mark out. Going through no, the, uh, the mountain ranges, ranges of northern Iraq, the Qandil Mountains, and then into Turkey you have the cities of Hakkari, Jezire, Shilopi, um, and Sirt, I think it's called, uh, Sirnak. And then further into Syria where the Kurds had expanded their, their, their territories and to all the, almost, as I said, all the way to the Mediterranean uh, Sea. So in that sense, the, sorry, the, the PKK movement, or the left wing of the Kurdish liberation movement, had become a physical obstacle to Erdogan's ambition, imperialist ambitions of expanding further down throughout the Middle East. In every way, the, the Kurds were becoming uh, a, a, a threat to Erdogan's regime and to his, to his ambitions. Um, the same goes in Syria, where the Kurds were not only fighting ISIS, but also the so-called FSA, the jihadi movement, which was supported by Turkey as a means of gaining influence uh, within Syria. So on that basis, Erdogan started a civil war against the, the, the Kurds in, in the summer of 2014. In the 20, summer of 2014, he started a one-sided civil war against the Kurds of Turkey, who've never done anything to, to, to harm him. And he, he used this to, on the one hand, whip up extreme nationalist hysteria to cut through the rising class struggle, to divert attention from the class problems that, that people had. Um, but also, literally, to destroy this landmass that, that the Kurds were gaining, which was becoming a threat to Turkey. If the, the Kurds consolidate this area that they control, this will be a powerful impetus, not just, just there, but further into the Kurdish uh, areas, which span you know, way into uh, Turkish territory. But, however, met by this offensive of Erdogan, the leaders of the movement, uh, didn't continue the path which has been successful uh, to begin with, the path of class struggle, revolutionary mass mobilization, but instead began uh, vacillating and, uh, and, and compromising basically at every single step. Every time Erdogan raised the pressure or different powers raised the pressure, the, move, the, the, the leaders of the movement thought that they could negotiate themselves or maneuver themselves uh, out of this situation. In Iraq, for instance, where, as I said, the PKK had enormous authority, especially amongst the youth, the PKK refrained from building a mass movement out of this, refrained from actually building a mass organization amongst the Iraqi youth. Why? Because they were having, because they didn't want to upset Iran and Iranian-supported proxies in, in, in Iraq. Instead, they thought, well, if the Iranians give us support or tacit support against Turkey, which, which the Iranians wouldn't mind, then uh, in return we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to Iraq later on. That was essentially the philosophy. That was a basic method of saying we're not going to fight the struggle here, but we're going to uh, focus on, uh, on Syria and uh, defending ourselves against Erdogan and using all the support we can get, i.e., in this case, Iranian support. For instance, in the, in the local Kurdish elections a few years back in the, uh, for the local self-government self of, of the Kurdish areas in Iraq, they, supported the, uh, they didn't put up their own list, they didn't put up independent candidates on a, uh, in a decisive way, uh, uh, in a serious way, but instead supported this other uh, organization which is called Goran, which is a, a corrupt, a liberal, uh, uh, bourgeois organization, uh, uh, essentially. They also developed ties with another party called the PUK, which is led by a guy called Masoud Ta uh, Talibani. Sorry, not Masoud, uh, I forgot his first name. <laughs> but the Talibani clan, which is essentially a tribal or a clan-based, a family-based organization. Again, a, a, a proxy of Iran in uh, that, that area. 
Um, at the same time, the PKK's Yazidi wing, which they developed, became a part of the uh, popular mobil mobilization units in Iraq. They w w received funds, even until recently, I'm not sure if they're doing it right now, but at least until six, seven months ago, receiving funds from, from the Iraqi central uh, government. Um, and all of this, obviously, while in purely military terms, might have made sense, but in political uh, terms, it was completely counterproductive because it undermined the PKK's authority amongst the youth in the area who weren't interested at all in making deals with this or that power, but were interested in wiping the slate clean and overthrowing all of them. Uh, and so in that sense, they, they limited themselves or they, they, they kind of sowed a divide between themselves and the radicalizing masses. In the uh, Kurdish independence referendum, which, happened, which took place last summer, again, this was a referendum. This was actually a referendum called by uh, Barzani, who's, as I said, a reactionary. But he, was, he felt that he was losing support, and he, th he thought that whipping up nationalist sentiment would help him regain support amongst, amongst the masses. Um, but that, obviously, he was doing it for, for reactionary ends, but this was a progressive, a revolutionary, he was trying to tap into a progressive revolutionary mood which did exist amongst the Kurdish masses in, in Iraq. And instead of tapping into that, uh, instead of saying to the Kurdish masses, yes, we also fight for uh, independence, but we fight for independence without these clans, without these tribes, without all the capitalists who are corrupt and who, are, and, and who you all hate, the, the PKK went to the other side, again, as a means to appease Iranians, uh, the Iranians and the Iranian-supported proxies in Iraq, and actually went against the referendum and say, you know, uh, uh, supported a no vote, essentially. Uh, in the end, the yes vote won by 90-some percent, 97 percent. Uh, and again, the PKK, uh, but, but, and, the, and the movement then afterwards was crushed by all the, all the, 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 the forces in the, in the region, the Americans, the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Turks, everyone united to crush this uh, independence movement. And the PKK basically stood silently uh, or you know, objected very, very weakly and only in, in, in words. Um, I'm just going to see here. Yes. Now, in Turkey as well, the movement has been weakened by its vacillations. When it got to power, uh, no one thought that it would gain this amount of uh, votes, 13, almost 14 percent. But after it did so, it became a point of reference for millions of radicalized uh, youth and workers in, in Turkey. But the only thing that a lot of people said were, well, we, we actually agree with the HDP, that we, we agree with, the, with, the, with this Kurdish movement on everything. The only thing is we're not sure that they won't sell out the whole movement in order to get some kind of national independence for, for nationalist aims, for Kurdish aims, essentially. And that's why a lot of Turkish youth and workers didn't really, uh, didn't, didn't support it in the first instance. But instead of then appealing to these and proving itself to fighting on a class basis, the Kurdish leaders fell back in a nationalist rhetoric uh, in, in the face of the attacks of Erdogan. And if, of, of course, from Erdogan's point of view, nationalism is what he wanted. Nationalism was what could, what could keep him, which, which was what could uh, strengthen him. And obviously, it's not an easy thing to fight against such a hysteria being built up in every single newspaper and every single media outlet and every single school and university. Uh, but nevertheless, by playing along with it, you're only strengthening the general uh, trend that Erdogan is, is achieving to aim. And at the same time, uh, not only were they falling into the nationalist trap, but they also at every single turn signaled that they were willing to cooperate and collaborate with, with Erdogan in return for a deal on the Kurdish uh, question and in, and in the Kurdish areas. In fact, just a couple of weeks after he started the civil war, which was in uh, August of, of uh, 2014, the HDP joined 
a, the provisional government of Turkey. So they joined a provisional government with Erdogan, who was at the same time waging, waging a, a, a war against the Kurds. Uh, and they did many such things which, which undermined, again, their, um, their authority, which in return led to, the following, in the following elections, them seeing uh, a, a slight uh, decrease in the number of votes uh, they got. Um, now, in the Kurdish areas of Turkey, while the civil war was taking place, there was enormous radicalization. And you have, Turkey has a lot of uh, Kurds, between 15 and 20 million Kurds uh, live there. And as Erdogan was attacking them, these, these masses were being brought out to the streets, were being brought into action. And you saw rolling general strikes in all of the areas, in all of the regions uh, that, that the Kurds lived in. An extremely radicalized mood, the youth were willing to fight, and at that point, again, the, the Kurds could have armed the masses and began at least to, to wage a defensive against, against the, 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 the brutality of, of, the, of the Turks. And in, in fact, in my opinion, they could have easily taken power in many of these areas. The mood was there, the people were ready to fight back. But they didn't do so, or only armed the population to a very, very low degree. Um, on the basis, on, with the excuse that they were too busy fighting in Syria. But the point is that not doing this was demoralizing the whole movement. And in the meantime, Erdogan was attacking the key towns controlled by, by the PKK in Turkey, the, the towns that I explained, them, which are kind of um, highlighted in the map basically raised these towns to the ground is Jezira, Sirnak, uh, uh, Hakkari, and a couple more, I, I can't remember the exact names of them. Raised these towns, these are not small towns, 100,000 people, 200,000 people live in there. And, and they were reduced to rubbles, literally. Uh, which again, was a big blow uh, to, to the movement uh, as a whole. Um, now, of course, the real reason for not doing this was, was not that it would, uh, that they were too busy fighting a war in Syria, because here they had millions of more people ready to fight to the end, ready to die for, for, for this cause. But it was because they didn't want to alienate the, the, the Americans and the West who were supporting them and was arming them in, 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 in Syria. Um, yes. And that's the final, th that's the, the, in Syria is, is the last kind of uh, area where they, where they made similar mistakes. Because the YPG was so effective and because of the, we the general weakness of US imperialism, the Americans had to lean on the Kurds to, to retain a foothold in Syria, essentially. And they became the most important ally of US imperialism uh, in the region. And at this stage, the Americans have dozens of bases throughout uh, uh, Syrian Kurdish uh, areas. But all of this, this so-called support for the Kurds have come at a certain cost. On the one hand, they forced a number of ex-FSA, Free Syrian Army units, to join in with the, with the Kurds. So under, undermining, again, the political uh, uh, radicalism of, of, of the movement. They've, they've pushed them to ally themselves with the, with a, with a Shamar tribe, which, which, is a, which is a tribe which goes from Syria all the way into Saudi Arabia which is a group which has its, completely its own agenda. It has nothing to do with uh, the fight for liberation of, 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 of nations or a fight against capitalism. Um, uh, and, and all of this, again, is under, has been undermining and uh, hollowing out the political uh, power of, of the movement. Not only have they allied, have they been working with the Americans, they've also allowed the Syrian regime forces into some of their areas. They've allowed Russian forces into some of their areas, you know, supposedly because then Turkey wouldn't attack them in those areas. They've allowed the French, the, the British. And even last summer when Saudi Arabia had a conflict with Qatar, the leaders of the uh, Syrian wing of the PKK came out saying that they were open to working uh, with Saudi Arabia. Now this is complete, this is, this is ridiculous because on the one hand here they are fighting ISIS which is the spawn of, this, of the Saudi royal family itself and on the other hand they're reaching out to, this, to, 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 to the kingdom 
which is probably, well, in, in real terms, is probably more reactionary than, than, than ISIS and commits, has committed more horrible crimes than ISIS. Um, now, the, the idea behind all of these alliances is that if we ally with this or that power, if we ally ourselves with the Americans, then the Kurds won't attack us. If we ally, the Turks won't attack us. If we ally ourselves with the Iranians, then they will leave us in peace in Iran and in Turkey. But every step that they take in doing this is politically undermining them. And what they don't realize is that for the, for the imperialists, Nations, small nations such as the Kurds are just small change. It's nothing. They, have, they, they serve no other purpose than to be used as, as they have been throughout their history and then just to be discarded uh, whenever they're finished. Because what can, what can the Kurds offer U.S. imperialism? Turkey is the most industrialized, the biggest economy of the whole uh, Middle East. It has an extremely important geopolitical position. The, the, the Americans have military bases, nuclear arms, uh, and a close collaboration through NATO with the Turks, whereas for the Kurds, they only serve to basically, for, for the Americans to maintain a foothold within Syria where they've lost everything else from their, from their uh, interventions. Other than that, they have nothing to offer from a capitalist point of view than barren lands, essentially, and mountainous, uh, mountainous uh, areas. Um, and we saw this in a couple of months ago when Turkey decided to attack the enclave of Afrin uh, in, in north, in north uh, western uh, Syria. And the Americans did nothing. And it was clear that there was a deal between the Americans and, and, and the Turks. And they even, made it, they, they even said so many times that this, they had no intentions of defending the Kurds in those areas. And how, how different is that reaction? to when, when the Islamists in Eastern Ghouta near Damascus were being attacked by the, by the Russians and the, uh, and the uh, Assad regime. And the Americans uh, fired these, these missiles and made a big hoo-ha about the so-called uh, uh, inhumanitarian nature of, nature of that, that, that offensive. Whereas in Afrin, hundreds of thousands of Kurds have been displaced, uh, killed, and there is essentially ethnic cleansing going on of that whole area. Uh, and while a, a, a small Islamist caliphate or principality is being in, introduced, supported by, by Turkey itself. It just shows what the, what the Kurds are in uh, the eyes of the Americans. And it's clear that the next step is the city of Manbij, which the Turks also want, and which, according to the Americans, even yesterday, that they're still negotiating about, whatever that means. It's clear that once ISIS is finished, uh, is fully defeated, and once the Americans have gotten what they could out of, uh, out of Syria, then they won't hesitate to sell out the Kurds. Uh, in, order to, in order to gain some concessions from their allies and, and enemies. So we see step by step the Kurdish movement is being isolated. Uh, and this political isolation uh, is only a precursor to a military isolation and a military crushing of the movement at some point uh, in, in the future. You have the US, the US has now complete knowledge and intelligence about everything that's going on, all the military installations, the hierarchy, the key personnel throughout Kurdish areas. It, and in fact, I was reading, um, was it Foreign Policy, this magazine, Foreign Policy, if, if you know it, about a year ago, and they said, well, maybe it's time for us to abandon the Kurds. They've been a great, great help for us, but maybe it's time for us to abandon them and support our real traditional allies uh, and do intelligence collaboration with them. What does, that, what does that mean? That means giving them all the targets and all the areas that they need to hit in order to uh, crush the, 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 the Kurdish movement in northern Syria. Um, this would be obviously a completely, this would be a, a disastrous event for the Kurds. And of course, on the one hand, we can't criticize the Kurds for just in principle using the fault line between different imperialist uh, nations. That's the, the, any nation, any revolutionary movement will have to do that. But there's a limit to that tactic. And, there's, and you cannot base your whole tactic on this. Uh, because this, the strongest point that the, the movement has is the political authority that it has. That's been what's been strengthening it. That's been what's been giving it its advances at, at every single term. It hasn't been because they have arms. They don't have any arms. They've been starved of, of arms. They don't have 
the funds, all of these things is not what gained the Kurdish movement its victories to begin with. Um, the, 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 the way that they advanced to begin with was in Turkey on the basis of a radical class-based approach, not a nationalist approach, but all, all Turkish uh, way of uniting all the workers and youth and all the oppressed uh, peoples of, of Turkey against the regime. And in Syria, in a distorted way, they gained their, their, their position from a, by revol mass revolutionary means, i.e. there was an all-Syrian revolution which, which weakened the state and then created this power vacuum that the Kurds could then, uh, could then step into. This, these are the, 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 the tactics and the strategies that the Kurds have to lean on in order to, to advance if they want to defend themselves and if they want, to, they want to strengthen and consolidate their position. And to say that this can't be done is also wrong, I would say, because the, although the Arab Revolution for now has ebbed, in every single country underneath the surface, revolution is still there and revolution is still bubbling away, just waiting for a focal point to come to the fore. In January, we saw the most uh, dangerous, in, in, from a point of view of the regime at least, the, most, uh, the, the strongest and most dangerous movements in, uh, in the, the last 40 years of Iranian history. A massive movement going through all uh, throughout Iran, in every single uh, town and, and, and city, drawing in tens of thousands of young people, mainly not composed of middle class people who normally would lead the, 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 the revolution, have been leading the revolutionary movements in Iran over the past period, but by people who, but working class and poor and poor middle class people who traditionally have been pillars of support for the regime. This is an extremely dangerous situation developing from the point of view of the regime, from our point of view, is extremely favorable. There's a revolutionary ferment and the regime is terrified of what could happen. And that's a movement that the Kurdish movement could, lean, uh, could, could reach out to and help organize and unite with against the central government in Iran. And once they take power in Iran, uh, this will send shockwaves throughout the region. Even in Iraq, which uh, surprisingly, although it has been, you know, it's been dominated by sectarian warfare, civil war, all kinds of barbaric uh, events over the past uh, period, you still have uh, uh, a rising class, rising class contradictions and class struggle, which, reflect, which was reflected in the uh, parliamentary elections just a few weeks ago. I don't know if any of you followed it, but uh, on the one hand in Iraq, there was a, historically the lowest participation in the elections. But this wasn't because people are not political, but this is based because people hate and are disgusted by the whole political elite. Every Iraqi you speak to uh, would say this, that they hate all of them. They're all thieves, they're all corrupt, uh, and they're all hated. And the people who did win was a coalition of, a, there was an Islamic demagogic cleric and, a, and the Iraqi Communist Party, which won which stood, although the, the, we have to say the, the guy who was leading the coalition, he's a demagogue, he's a reactionary, but the program that he stood on was uh, against corruption, against poverty, against uh, uh, inflation, unemployment, but more importantly, against all foreign powers meddling in Iran, i.e. both Iran, in Iraq, both Iran and the Americans, as well as against sectarianism. And sectarianism, as, as you might know, has been the, the core basis of the rule of the Iraqi ruling class ever since the occupation uh, that, uh, that the, the Americans and, and the British carried out uh, in 2003. So you see, even in Iraq, the, 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 the ground is prepared for a mass revolutionary movement for the, for the Kurdish mass, for the Kurdish movement to, lead, uh, to reach out to and to ally itself with against the, the, the central government. In Turkey as well, the situation is not far behind. The movement in 2013 was defeated because on the one hand, it didn't gain anything. There was, the leadership wasn't able to show a way forward. Uh, and all of the different political parties, which would traditionally uh, reflect this pressure from below, one way or another, 
uh, sold out essentially, betrayed the movement. So he never gained a political expression, but nevertheless, underneath the surface, there's enormous dissatisfaction with the government. And now we see that Turkey is going into a very severe economic crisis. The Turkish lira has lost 30% since uh, in the past six months against the dollar. And this is only going to continue. Tur the, the Turkish economy is in a, in a very big troubles. And all of this is going to lead to rising class, uh, class struggle. It's going to lead to explosive uh, movements in, in Turkey. And again, a great opportunity for the Kurdish uh, movement to reach out and ally itself with the Turkish workers and youth against the Erdogan regime. Because on a purely military basis and on a nationalist basis, there's no way that you can defeat the Turkish state. The Turkish military is the fourth largest or fifth largest military in the world is very well equipped. You cannot defend it militarily, but only by breaking it on class lines, by appealing to the soldiers who, who don't have any interest in killing uh, Kurds uh, and weakening the, 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 the grip that the Erdogan, that Erdogan's nationalism give, gives over the, uh, the, 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 the masses. Uh, to break the, his state in half uh, and then wage a revolutionary war against him. That's the way forward. That's the way they want to begin with. And that's the method that they have to use in order to, de to defend their position uh, today. Now, just to, just, to, just to end, the past 10 years have been uh, probably the most turbulent of the whole history of the Middle East. And that's saying a lot because of, because of this, the way the situation normally is in the Middle East. You've seen the Arab revolutions, you've seen the rise of ISIS, you've seen civil wars in Iraq, in Syria, in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen, in Libya. And you've seen revolutions and revolutionary movements in every single country. And what this essentially reflects is the same process, is a process of the senile decay of capitalism, is, is, a, is, is a reflection of the fact that capitalism is not capable as a system, as a regime, to solve any of the problems that the masses and that the that societies in the region uh, uh, face today. And the old system of states which was imposed by artificially imposed by Western imperialism is beginning to disintegrate. Um, and we see that the only, the, only, uh, uh, the only result of imperialist uh, and, and Western intervention in, in the whole region has been to leave a barbaric uh, mess. And the only solution really to all of this is not to fight, to, to arm, to, to ally yourself with this or that uh, ruling class, with this or that establishment of this or that uh, um, uh, country, but to wage a struggle against the whole system, against all of these ruling classes, which none of which are able to solve the situation, overthrow capitalism, and essentially establish a socialist federation of, of the whole Middle East. Thank you very much.